terrorists, assassins, mafia bosses, serial killers. The Russian courts have given them the maximum penalty, life imprisonment. Here, that really means until the end of their lives. They are all imprisoned on Fire Island, the island of the damned. For centuries, during the time of the Tsars, the prison was a monastery. Now, it houses 200 dangerous criminals. No one has ever managed to escape. Our walls are between 80 and 150 centimeters thick. You can't dig a hole through them overnight without being noticed. The island is surrounded by water and swampland. In the summer, temperatures reach 35 degrees Celsius. In winter, they can fall to minus 30. There are inmates in this northern Russian maximum security prison who would prefer the death penalty to continuing their incarceration here. At the moment, I'd prefer the firing squad. What have I got to live for anyway? A paid job in the prison sewing shop is a privilege. Those who conform are allowed to work here. Those who don't, can only escape the boredom of their cells during yard time. Pacing round and round in tiny inhuman cages for the rest of their lives. Fire Island is reserved for those men who committed their crimes with particularly lower motives and extreme cruelty. Five p.m. Cell number eight, wing four. Captain Dimitriev, open up. Prisoner, hands behind your back. Yuri Levanov, convicted under Section Two of Articles One Hundred and Five, One Hundred and Three. Sentence was passed on March 24th, 2016. In cell eight, there are eight inmates. Three are at work. Turn to face me. Good morning. We'll now search your cell for forbidden items. No forbidden items here. Turn your back to me. We're putting the handcuffs on. Sharp and pointed items are forbidden. They could be used as weapons or tools for escaping. Come out here. Face the wall. Other side. Any prohibited items on you? No. Articles 105 and 103 of the Russian Criminal Code deal with murder. Sex offender and killer Levanov cruelly and brutally murdered his girlfriend. Guards search Levanov's cell. They're looking for anything that could be used as a weapon or a means of escape. All larger objects are fixed into place to prevent them from being used in a riot situation, says the deputy prisoner governor. All secured. The beds are welded to the floor. 
Эта камера для содержания четырех осужденных. Cells like these always accommodate three or four inmates. The only place with any privacy is the toilet. That's bolted to the floor too. The lights, plumbing system, it all works. The ventilator gets rid of the smoke very quickly. We can also see everything the men do in their cells through the security cameras. And we can maintain contact with the prisoners through an intercom system without any risk to ourselves. Move it. Go in here, then face me. Take the handcuffs off. In this cell, psychologists and profilers normally work with the prisoners. They compile offender profiles for crime prevention purposes. I've committed rape and murder in a very cruel way. What do you mean by very cruel? I abused my girlfriend. Don't know what to say. I injured her internal organs as well. What does that mean? I'm ashamed to speak about it. What did you do? I tore her internal organs out with my bare hands. Levinov committed his first sex offense at the age of 17. As a juvenile, Levanov was convicted of abusing a nine-year-old girl. He tried to rape her. She was the daughter of his brother's partner. Pictures from Russian television. Levanov had to serve a four-year term in prison for child abuse. Back outside, he murdered Alina Sorkina in a garage yard in the central Russian city of Suransk. Levanov had met the 21-year-old on the internet. Then, as he told the police, he lured the woman here to carry out sexual experiments with her. Then, suddenly, he completely lost control. Levanov shows the officers where and how he committed the murder. At first, I hit her in the face a few times. Why? asks one of the officers. So she wouldn't put up any resistance. This police video is admissible as evidence in court. We had a psychiatric assessment done in a clinic. And the doctors concluded he was of completely sound mind when he committed the crime. And that is still the case today. For this murder, for particularly lower motives, Levanov was sentenced to 23 years in a prison camp. The state prosecutors appealed, demanding life imprisonment instead, and they were successful. 
In Russia, life imprisonment literally means detention until the day you die. Theoretically, after 25 years, there's a chance to be released for good behavior or mitigating circumstances. And that's what Livanov is hoping for. He claims that at the time of the offense, he was not responsible for his actions because he was under the influence of drugs. I smoked spice during my first prison term. And after I was released, I used it more often. It's so easy to get. The dealers just leave it in a prearranged place. One dose costs 1,500 or 2,000 rubles. This synthetic stuff changes you, makes you aggressive. And time just starts racing. Two thousand rubles are about 28 euros. Reduced responsibility, remorse, good behavior. That's the strategy Levinov hopes may enable him to leave Fire Island after 25 years. Up to now, no one who has been sentenced to life imprisonment in Russia has ever been released. When the time comes, much will depend on the assessments of psychologists. Okneni Ostrov, the Fire Island, is Russia's oldest maximum security prison. Surrounded by sparsely populated marshlands, the once orthodox monastery looms above Lake Novozero, similar to Alcatraz in San Francisco Bay. The penitentiary IK-5 lies around 600 kilometers north of Moscow, surrounded by the 12-square-kilometer lake. The neighboring island of Sladki, which means sweet, is mainly home to prison guards. Many of them still live in run-down wooden huts from Soviet days. In some places on Lake Novozoro, time seems to have stood still. The monastery was founded on the island by Saint Cyril in the 16th century, and because torches burned there at night, the people in the surrounding villages came up with the name Island of Fire. The October Revolution in 1917 swept the largely atheist Bolsheviks to power. They drove out the monks and converted the monastery into a gulag for enemies of the state. In 1994, Fire Island became a maximum security prison for dangerous criminals, a place of no return. Igor Dashkovsky is the deputy prison governor. He's been working on Fire Island for 11 years and knows it like the back of his hand. Security rounds. Several times a day, prison guards check the walls and fences. Exclusion zone, no admission. We are here at the entrance to the prison. Detained behind these walls, there are 189 men. Each of them has been sentenced to life. Terrorists, serial killers, sex offenders, gang bosses, and murderers. They've committed a variety of crimes. Come with me.
Right behind the entrance is the prison's administration. The administration and the prisoner's wing are right next to each other because we are on a small island. When the building was a monastery, there used to be water here. Boats went through the north gate directly to the Church of the Resurrection of Christ. Now we're going into the living quarters. By living quarters, Dashkovsky means the maximum security cells in the former Church of the Resurrection. Checkpoint two, prisoner's wing. The living area is relatively compact, with four buildings. Wing 4 was renovated two years ago. Foundations and walls are historic. This is the former monastery church of the Resurrection of Christ. Here on the right is Wing 1. It's currently being renovated. All the buildings, meanwhile, have running water and are connected to the sewerage system. There are new security cameras everywhere, and we recently installed a ventilation system. Come with me. The ventilation system means that during the warmer seasons, at least some of the windows can be kept closed. Because once the snow is gone, clouds of mosquitoes from the neighboring marshes plague the entire island. In the summer, temperatures can reach 35 degrees Celsius. In winter, they can fall to minus 30. Comrade Lieutenant Colonel, nothing to report. In this wing, there are 88 prisoners. 21 present the risk of escape. We're in wing four, which, as I said, underwent a complete refurbishment two years ago. During the building work, we discovered historic frescoes and had them restored. This one is Methodius. And there's also a Cyril fresco that's been preserved. Why was a monastery like this converted into a prison? It was an obvious choice because of its location on an island. Water is the perfect escape barrier. Up to now, there hasn't been one serious attempt to escape. That's because beyond the lake, there are only swamps and forests. And so no one knows which direction to take. Our monastery walls are between 80 and 150 centimeters thick. There's no way anyone can dig a hole through them overnight without being noticed. It's not realistic. In each wing, there is at least one bathroom. The inmates of each cell all go to the showers together. That's three or four men at a time. When they finished, the next one goes in, one cell after the other. It's for security reasons. The hot water comes from the boilers. 
There are 45 lifers in this building. Each of them takes a shower twice a week. Are there security cameras here as well? No, they have their privacy here. The guard locks this door and checks everything through this window. Video surveillance in the bathroom is against the law. This is our medical wing. That's Viktor Sigievich. He's in charge. On the left and right are the treatment rooms. This is the isolation room. If an inmate catches something infectious, he's put in this cell, so he won't pass it on to anyone else. We can treat dental problems as well. The doctor comes once a month, or more often if it's needed. And if any inmates need an injection or an intravenous drip, that all happens in this room. The Island of Fire, an almost self-sufficient maximum security prison in the middle of nowhere. Only food supplies need to be delivered. There's even a sewing shop. It stands on the site of old Russian Orthodox graves. In the monastery, there was a graveyard, of course. When we built the sewing shop, we found this gravestone. Lieutenant Colonel Dmitry Timoshin died 10th December 1858. Cells for dangerous criminals in the Church of the Resurrection of Christ. Frescoes in the prison computer room. The founder of the monastery, Cyril of Novozero. Many former atheist inmates have meanwhile found solace in the Russian Orthodox faith. The murderer, Mikhail Bukharov, has documented his path to religion in tattoos. He stabbed an acquaintance 48 times, more or less dismembering him. He was afraid the acquaintance would press charges against him after committing a robbery. Can you see who's holding this being in his hand? The devil. Yes, the devil or evil. What's this tattoo got to do with God? Nothing. I did it before I'd found God. And when did you find your faith? Three years after the tattoo on my back. Is that prisoner you? Yes, above me is God, who forgives our sins. And you really are religious today? Yes. So you found your way to God in prison? Yes, after the sentence of death by firing squad. When was that? 1994. Why wasn't the sentence carried out? Because there was a moratorium on death penalties. When? I think it was 1994. So the death penalty converted you? Yes.
The moratorium on the death penalty has been in force in Russia since 1996. Bukharov, meanwhile, is in favor of it ending. At the moment, I would prefer to be shot. What am I supposed to do here? What have I got to live for? There's always the chance of parole after 25 years. What chance? It's all just theory. Some have been here for 30 years. Nobody gets out alive. Bukharov believes the only way he'll leave Fire Island is in a coffin, because he committed a particularly brutal murder. For him, the 48 stab wounds are a death penalty in installments. Seven o'clock in the morning. The early shift takes over. More patrols. Walls and fences are checked again. In the prison sewing shop, too, the working day begins. The prisoners here are volunteers. The job is a privilege. Anyone hoping to get out after 25 years does his best to get his hands on one of the few sewing machines to earn money for a life in freedom. Sex offender and killer Levinoff firmly believes he will leave the island alive one day. He stoically endures all the strict security measures. The men make life jackets, souvenirs, and working clothes for a private company in Moscow. About 100 euros a month is the top salary on the prison island. These are things we make here. Souvenirs, life jackets, for children too. Working clothes for medical staff, building workers, security staff, and welders, with a lining for winter, and rucksacks. What do the prisoners do with the money? They're paid based on performance. They can save the money or use it to buy food in our shop. Or they can send it to relatives. Some inmates, like Levinoff, also make so-called compensation payments to the relatives of their victims. I have to pay compensation because I was sued for damages. Who sued you? The victim's mother. How much did you have to pay? Two to three thousand, depending on what I earn. Rubles? Yes. Every month? Yes. For how long? 10 to 15 years. How much is that altogether? Two million rubles. Two million rubles is the equivalent of about 28,600 euros. After work, they go out to the exercise yard. Two hours are allowed each day, but only a few of them take full advantage of this opportunity. In winter, there's usually an icy wind blowing off Lake Navazaro. And in summer, the inmates are plagued by countless mosquitoes. 
Their yard time takes place in these small, rusty cages. That's the extent of their freedom of movement in human conditions. One prisoner to each cage. Move it up against the wall. So now go in. Most guards know roughly what crimes the prisoners have committed, but don't really bother with the details. A matter of self-protection, so they don't become emotionally brutalized themselves. Analyzing crimes is a psychologist's job. It's for them to say whether a lifer is theoretically mature enough to be allowed out on parole after 25 years. I keep out of it most of the time. Otherwise, all this filth would drive me crazy. Lots of the murders are simply just barbaric. Daylight. A few steps without handcuffs and no cellmates to disturb him. Sex offender and killer Levinoff tries to keep himself alive mentally through the power of positive thinking. Life imprisonment has nothing to do with the end of your life. Every human being lives, learns, works, and despite all the adversities, tries to start a new chapter in their lives. Wouldn't the death penalty spare you a lot? No, not everyone would want to die. Not even in a situation like this. I love my life and don't want to lose it. With the brutality of their crimes, murderers like Levinoff have clearly crossed a line. That's the main criticism of the deputy prison governor. As a human being, I'm in favor of him being executed for the brutal murder of his girlfriend. As a prison officer, I'm against the death penalty. Because as a lifer, he's confronted with his crime every day, every minute of his life. And in line with current practice, that will continue until the day he dies. Come out now. Any prohibited items on you? No. Many prison officers consider life imprisonment to be harder punishment than death. These men don't believe that Levinoff will ever be released. They think his remorse and admission of guilt are just an act, with every action and reaction geared precisely to securing his release in 25 years, thus escaping his responsibility. The sex offender and killer's relatives obviously take a similar view. None of them want anything to do with Levinoff. Some contact would certainly be possible. Even personal meetings between offender and family are possible on Fire Island. The only condition is that the prison authorities must have no security concerns. Only those showing good behavior can expect permission to receive visitors. There are even special small apartments for these visits in the former monastery. Учреждение имеет 
units. We have two apartments where inmates and their families can meet. In the first 10 years of imprisonment, it's once a year for three days. After that, for good behavior, two such visits can be arranged per year. This is the children's room. A maximum of two adults and one child are allowed to visit. They have to present documents showing that they're close relatives. Here's the kitchen. And back here are the toilet and shower. How can you guarantee that a prisoner on a life sentence won't do any harm to his wife or his parents? We can't guarantee anything. That's why every inmate is screened thoroughly before any kind of meeting takes place. If we think there won't be any problems, we give the green light. Has anything ever happened? No. The prisoners have enough brains not to do anything. After all, it's their wives, parents and children visiting them. During the approval process, we check through all their letters. We make sure there are no insults going back and forth. We check everything. Besides Fire Island, there are five other maximum security prisons in Russia. In these institutions, almost 2,000 men are serving life sentences. Maximum security prisons are very different from the widespread prison camps. This one lies about 1,000 kilometers southeast of Fire Island in the town of Yavas, in the Republic of Mordovia. We are now entering a camp where only former state officials are detained. Prison commander Shaliev takes us through the prison camp. Open the doors. The criminals in prison camps are slightly less dangerous than those in maximum security prisons. Freedom of movement is significantly greater, and the men live in so-called barracks rather than cells. Some have also committed serious crimes, however. Former police officer Viktor Saliev is here for double murder. He was a member of a mafia clan and was sentenced to 17 years imprisonment. What exactly did you do? I didn't kill ordinary people. They were members of a rival gang. What did you do to them? Shot them. I shot them. All in all, there are about 650,000 men incarcerated in Russia's prison camps. Morning roll call. This is done several times a day by the camp authorities to make sure all prisoners are still present. In contrast to maximum security prisons like Fire Island, attempts to escape are not uncommon here. Some dig tunnels. Others try to ram their way out using camp vehicles. There are countless stories. The daily routine is strictly regulated. Breakfast, work, lunch, back to work, evening meal, free time, bedtime. The days in the camps are very similar to those in the maximum security prisons. The food hut. Prisoners cook and bake for prisoners. In most Russian prison camps, there's a kind of caste system. 
The topmost caste is made up of the crime bosses. In the second caste are the common criminals, like Saliev. Both groups avoid the lowest caste, prison informers and homosexuals. Is there a caste system here too? A hierarchy? Let me just finish eating before I answer. No, there's no caste system here. Everyone's equal? You can all sit where you want to? Sure, wherever you want to. Whether this answer is true is difficult to say. Western camera crews don't have enough time in the prisons to find out what the inmates really think. This is what we call the industrial area. Here there's a sewing shop and a pasta factory. We also grow our own vegetables. Who do you sell to? We keep the food here. The textiles go to clients, private companies. Pasta production in the Yavas prison camp. Here too, there are parallels to the maximum security prisons. Work is the reward for good behavior. Those behaving badly are condemned to just sitting around. I like working. It makes the time go by faster. What else is the work good for? Working means good behavior. Good behavior can mean parole. Early release is definitely a realistic possibility in prison camps. In maximum security prisons, that's not yet the case due to the high risk for the population. When the shift's over, they return to their barracks. The prisoners are not allowed to take any pointed objects out with them. Only those who submit unconditionally can have any hope of being released early from this hellish place. Back to Fire Island on Lake Novozoro in northern Russia. There are a few inmates who are not serving life sentences. Drug dealers, thieves, protection racketeers. Their job is to provide for the lifers. We have our own bakery. This is where we bake bread for the inmates and for sale as well. The camera lens steams up due to the great difference in temperature. Outside, minus 17 degrees. In here, it's around 20. Rather less dangerous inmates do the baking and cooking for their extremely dangerous comrades. This is our kitchen, where the food for the lifers is prepared. Let me have a look. Hi. Soup, tuna salad, meat. Because a Western camera crew is here today, it's difficult to say whether the lifers are getting some kind of special feast from their fellow inmates. In Russian prisons, inmates are used for all kinds of work in order to save personnel costs. Could 
cooks, bakers, heating fitters, electricians, welders. The list of the jobs the inmates do is long. We have 53 prisoners here who keep this high security prison running on a day to day basis. But the prisoners are, of course, not allowed to work in any security relevant areas. Those serving life sentences have their food brought to their cells three times a day. Bringing them all together in one dining hall is out of the question. It would be too dangerous. Many of those imprisoned on Fire Island don't believe they will ever be out on parole after 25 years, so they have nothing to lose. They could attack guards or fellow inmates or try to take hostages to exchange for their freedom. Some of the men are not satisfied with the size of the portions. Give me some more meat. What's wrong? I want some more meat. Just take your plate. Do I have to tell you again? I don't want any more pasta. What? No more pasta. Some lifers like to write letters to the state prosecution service complaining that they are being badly treated or not being given their toiletries. It's all lies. They're bored and they want a bit of attention. But most of them don't want to get involved in all this nonsense with complaints. Human rights organizations from the West and in Russia see this matter differently. According to Human Rights Watch and Memorial, the Russian prison system is arbitrary and violent. The camera crew have seen no evidence of such conditions. However, only hand-picked inmates like Levinov are allowed to speak in the presence of Western journalists. Not a single word of criticism comes out of his mouth. The sex offender and killer knows all too well that his slim hopes of parole would otherwise be completely compromised. What do you think about most? About early release. What's the earliest you could get out of here? Parole after 25 years. What does that depend on most? Good behavior. But this 25-year thing has never happened yet, has it? I don't know, honestly. So you've still got hope? Yes, I still have hope. Back in the cell. Come here. Prisoner Levanov. Total submission. No answering back. And don't do anything wrong. From his own experience, Yuri Levanov knows the rules of the game that can get him paroled. In his first prison term for child abuse, the good behavior strategy had worked. But there is one decisive difference between then and now. At that time, Levanov was in a normal prison camp. Now, after having committed a particularly brutal murder, He's serving a sentence of life imprisonment 
on the Island of the Damned.